How about you? Always with us. So in circumstances beyond our control, who do we look to? Him. And, it, and we need help sometimes to keep that focus. When our hearts hurt and our bodies are hurting, we need somebody to come along, not to fuss, but to encourage, to point to Scripture, to lift up the living God who can work in your life in powerful ways. Um, you know, as we get older, gravity wins. You ever notice? Gravity wins as we get older. And um, I overheard a conversation of some women this week who were talking about, one of them said, I stand up, try to get taller. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything. I just heard it. And the other one said, I sit down a lot because I think it just keeps me from wearing out. And maybe I, now gravity is going to get you sitting, walking, or lying in your bed. Gravity is going to get you. Just look in the mirror. All of us 70-year-olds even, close to it, I'm right with you. Um, I notice that things are dropping sometimes. And I notice that I go to six foot on the chart now instead of six foot and a half inch. So I'm shrinking already. And when I slumped at the doctor, when I went to get the first time I ever had a primary care doctor, so he had to have his little checkup. You know, he puts me in, measures my height, the nurse does, the worker there. And I'm, she's got me down about three inches shorter than I am. I guess I'm slumped over. I hated being there. That was the problem. I was afraid, I was afraid they were going to have a needle. And they did have a needle, but I survived that one. But gravity wins. But nothing wins over Jesus. Not one enemy, not one devil, not one. In the new man, we live. One of these days we lay down this body, but we don't die. The body goes back to the dust. We do not face a second death. We get to be with the Lord, and He's going to give us a new house, a new body. And that's going to be a great day. Amen? Amen. Just think. You're going to see like you've never seen, know what you've never known, and be able to be totally without any kind of pain or problem or difficulty, no loss, no grieving, nothing but the glorious reality of the kingdom of God revealed fully to us. What a day that will be. It's an inheritance laid up for you when you see the king. Thank God for that. I said that for me. I hope you in, received from it, but I needed to perk me up before I got to the scriptures here today for the message. So the truth always perks us up and helps us see and trust and walk. We're going to the uh, fifth chapter of Acts again. We read from the fifth chapter in the reading, but I'm going to start reading now where we stopped a while ago. Verse 27 is the beginning place. Hear the word of the Lord. And when they had brought them, now they've arrested them or rearrested them, brought them back to the council. When they had brought them, they, they set them down, set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in, the, in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I think it's pretty interesting that they never say his name. You ever notice? They don't, they're not going to mention the name of Jesus right here because they don't want to deal with that guy. That's the one they're talking about, but they're not going to name him. They're just going to point it out that they know this man's blood you're going to bring upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. That's what they've been saying. The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. Peter has said that now more than once in this early stage of the body of Christ's development, New Testament. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, let me say it again, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader, this is the ESV now, leader and Savior. Might say prince and Savior or something else. There are several words that can be used there, and I'll get to that before we quit today. Leader and Savior to give repentance to Israel 
and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. That's how quickly it gets there. Wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council, and there are Pharisees yet involved here, but they're in a minority in the Senate. Sadducees, more Sadducees than Pharisees, and no doubt the main man is a Sadducee. The Sadducee party is associated with him. So, but this, uh, this Pharisee has some uh, recognition and acceptance. In fact, this is the Pharisee rabbi who taught Paul. Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and that's who we're talking about here. Gamaliel is there. Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, Take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, Gamaliel says, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. Now that's a change. They beat them this time, whipped them, and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council. Listen, what, they, what are they doing? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, counting it a joy, a rejoicing thing to suffer for him. And every day in the temple, notice how they slow down. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's God's man, God's redeemer. Jesus is. They didn't slow down at all. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of that word as well. Last week we were we were looking at this phrase in verse 32 of chapter 4, and we didn't get very far beyond it, really. Now the full number, verse 32 says, of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, or one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, meaning that everything they had would be available if needed to minister to those who needed anything among them. What we get is one heart and mind and a mindset that is produced by what the Lord has done in the hearts of this people. It's not just a human flesh decision to look at their goods in a different way. They look at their possessions in a different way because they have been changed on the inside and connected not only to the Lord, but in heart and soul to one another. They were family. They were together as one. They were not families now in that context. They were family. And he was in charge of what he wanted to do with their lives, their time, their energy, their possessions. And it's still the same. We're still stewards of everything we possess. We answer not to men, but to God. We don't build a gathering of all the goods and say, now we have this common pot, everybody put it in. We don't do that. And they didn't do that. They simply met the needs of the people among them who were their brothers and sisters, and they did it out of a heart which was one, out of a soul that was one in the body of Christ. 
And of course, then we talked about a little bit about Barnabas who sold his property and gave everything that he got for it to the apostles to see, oversee it in that use. And then for the copycats, Ananias and Sapphira, who decided they would sell a piece of property and act like they gave everything they got, only they would keep back some for themselves. And that's what they did. That was the problem. It was deceit. It was hypocrisy. It was lying. All those things are revealed in Scripture, and God dealt with it pretty aggressively. No human being had anything to do with the death of either the man or his wife. Peter is telling him what has happened and announces the fact that he's going to die, but he doesn't touch him. Nobody touches him. He just dies. The shock of it, the reality of it, God dealing with his church, maintaining the purity that goes with one heart and one mind congregation and keeps them aware that this holiness that is part of everything they are, God takes very seriously. And there was much work yet to do in laying the foundation. And when we get to the end of that series of verses on Ananias and Sapphira, verse number 11, great fear came upon the whole church. First place in Acts that this congregation of people is referred to as church first use of ecclesia in the book of Acts. Because, you, know, you read the Septuagint, which is, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and there's a word there that normally identifies the congregation of God's people, a certain Hebrew word which is translated in the Septuagint every time by ecclesia. So there is a purposed use of the word right here saying these people in Jerusalem at this time are truly God's chosen people. They're part of the congregation of God, these people that are believing on Jesus, these people who are being transformed in heart. And so you people who have been born again and made new and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you people who confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you are among God's people, the congregation that belongs to Him. Anybody happy with that? They get up in the morning, and who's the commander-in-chief? Jesus Christ is. Who is the God who rules over all? The God who created everything through His Son. The God who is marvelously at work in His church. That's who we serve and worship and walk with. Wow. That's good. That is very good, in fact. Now, let me, let me look at verses 12 through 16 for a moment. Um, and we'll, we'll do a little bit of what the story is and their punishment, and then I want to focus on a couple of words to finish today, okay? Um, verse 12 of chapter 5, when you read this, what, how do you feel when you read this? I mean, nobody, they didn't go to the newspaper and take out an ad that says, if you'll bring your, your sick people onto the street tomorrow, Brother Peter's going to walk down through here and see if we can heal them all. How many recognize there's a lot of spontaneity here that is evident of the Holy Spirit at work? Now, much of the time as we've moved along as, as the church, particularly in an entertainment-centered country like ours, we end up promoting a lot of things that probably get us in more trouble than do us much good. And I think, I think when you read this account, you ought to get excited about the fact that God can work any way He wants to, and He will decide how it's going to be. Once it starts happening, people recognize it and get in on it. They don't want to miss out on it. So when I read this account, here's what it says. Many signs and wonders were regularly, regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. All of these signs and wonders situations in this event is, are being done through the apostles. The apostles are the ones who are sent as witnesses to the resurrected Lord. They are used of God to proclaim this gospel. Peter and John are the main names at this juncture, but they're all there. So it, they were doing these, um, well, they weren't doing the miracles. They were just laying hands on people. They were just there. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest, that is, people who were not part of the church, didn't dare jump up and run in and say, I'm a part. Nope. They didn't dare join because we just had some deaths in the church. We just had some hard dealings, and they knew about it. 
And so what the Scripture says here is that none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. They didn't join them just with flippant attitudes, but they had, a, they had them in high regard, held them in high regard. They recognized something going on here. They weren't jumping on them down wanting to hurt them or get them out of town. The people were paying attention. And then this goes on to say, more, listen to this, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. We've had 3,000. We've had the number 5,000 men, men, both times, maybe, probably. Now we got multitudes of men and women. Multitude. How much is multitudes? Uh, let me just say it this way. It's a bunch. It's a lot. It's just a whole lot of people. Multitudes of both men and women. And that, that is one word that tells us maybe even in those men they listed earlier, it was men and women. But in either case, it was a lot of people. And here it's multitudes, men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all, all, A-double-L, -L, all healed. Something's going on here. And it's something outside of human thought our human energy. God is at work. And people were getting in on it. Now, when you read the rest of the New Testament and follow Brother Peter in, in the sections that we have in him or in the Gospels and in his writings, you don't see this as a common thing happening all the time where you have people going, every time Peter comes to a town, they drag people into the street. There was an anointing resting upon these apostles in their preaching and in their ministry to one another. It was potent action of the Holy Spirit happening here. And I don't think when we ask the Lord to work, and I've been asking Him, Lord, um, send your Holy Spirit today. Come. I know that you're here, and I acknowledge that every time. You said you would n always be there when we got together in the name of Jesus. You would be there. Come and manifest your presence in a way to people who so desperately need you, Lord. And we don't even have to see it or feel it. Somebody just needs to know when they walk out of here that God has been here with them, and they are not the same. They can think different. They can deal with things better. They can trust Him more. Something that might, then, then we get a testimony or two, and everybody says, I want to testify too. I didn't have anything to say before, but you know, I was sitting in service the other day, and I, I, I just felt the Lord's presence. I know I'm, this feeling thing can get disturbed, but I, I'm, I've always had feelings about things. Haven't you? I grew up on a farm. I had feelings about cats and dogs and animals of all kinds. I loved them. I cared for them. We got two crazy cats at our house now because one of them rode my truck home from the grocery store under the hood. And I tried to said, we tried to talk ourselves out of keeping him and said, how are we not going to keep him? He was sent to us from Kroger. <laughs> it was in the holidays. We went out to the truck and somebody had hand lettered a, a thing and stuck it under my windshield saying, uh, there's a cat somewhere in your truck. I thought, they put it there. <laughs> and I looked everywhere I could, couldn't find him. So we drove home, forgot about it, thought he was gone, didn't matter. Unloaded the truck outside the garage, got everything done, put the truck inside, in and out of there feeding the birds, etc. Got up, went in there the next morning. He's knocked down stuff everywhere. He came out in the night. So I knew there is a cat loose in our garage. It took us a day and a half to finally catch him. I knew where he was. He was under the Toyota hood. Where he could sleep. I, you ought to get smart. That car is going to go somewhere someday. He was under there, and we couldn't. We took the hood, raised it up, and he'd get away every time. Finally snared him. You know how big he was? He about that tall. And he was about that long. And he's still a monster. And I still can't believe that God sent him, you know? But I, with a little character, we, we started to name him Dog. 
because he picks up stuff and carries it. Now he's got a cloth ball. He picks it up and carries it and drops it at your foot and waits for you to throw it. And he goes and gets it, brings it back. This is a cat. So Grace is writing down yesterday. My hands are kind of snapping crazy, but she was writing down a dog food, cat food we were going to get. So she write down on her list. I saw it, cat dog. I said, "What is cat dog?" She was thinking the cat was a dog again. That's how it works, you know. But we love those animals because they're fun. They're nuts, but they're fun. And uh, maybe we'll keep them. I don't know, but I guess we will, as long as the Lord keeps us keeping them. But, you know, we just, it's just amazing how much, when God works in us, how many things change in our lives, how much we care for and love one another. We want to testify to God's goodness, don't we? We want to testify to the sense of His presence. We want to testify to the reality of His promise. And I, I think as we obey God and open our hearts to Him, looking at one another as brothers and sisters and loving one another, we're going to be saying things to one another that are encouraging. We're going to be paying attention to one another's needs, not in a snoopy way, but in a way that helps. And we're going to be willing to testify to how we saw God working after they begin to testify, and we're going to testify too. And God's going to work in all of us. I'm asking him to make this church what he wants it to be and to use us like he wants to use us in the days ahead. There are so many people lost around us. How many of you know that the, one of the largest groups of people in our culture is going to get larger all the time are old people? I probably shouldn't say it like that. I should just say the elderly. The numbers are way up because we're living a lot longer, which means that we have a whole bunch of folk, many people who've lived a long time and never met Jesus, who might be pretty ripe for hearing a good news story on the edge of home because they don't know where they're going. There are those that just don't think there's anything after that. You're like a dog. You die, you're done. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. There is a God who loved you enough to send his son to die for you. Don't wait. Don't wonder. Just pay attention. See what that word says. Let the Holy Spirit make it so alive that you believe. Because God is the one who brings the truth to us in such a way that we are enabled to believe. He calls us out of darkness. I thought I was good when I was a little kid, and I was good. You asked if you, my mother was still here, she'd tell you. He was a good kid. And as the years got by, she thought I was even better than good. You know, as you get older, you lose the bad stuff sometimes. But the night I got, I got, the night Jesus came into my life, I don't even know how to phrase that anymore. But he met me. I met him. He transformed my inner man. I was not the same good kid. I saw myself as lost and undone filthy in sin my little untruth my little manipulation all became big and Jesus came into my heart that's the only way I know how to say it Christ the anointed one the Messiah came into my life he took me on a different road been around a long time now but I am so thankful I am so thankful that he found me in my place of sin and called me to himself. And because I'm thankful, I was eager to do something for him. At the very beginning, we had a group of teenagers, we sang, and we'd sing a lot. And we'd do whatever they asked us to do in a little bitty church where I grew up. And uh, everything that came along, we got to participate in it early on. And then I got to teach a little bit, run the Sunday school. I wasn't 20 yet, but I was involved in a little church. 
And then I didn't want to preach. I'd seen enough of that. I thought these people don't even hardly get paid. In our churches, some of them didn't get paid. My uh, pastor, Clyde Stockton, at the time after I started preaching about then, did a, did a several night revival in Phelps. Anybody know where Phelps is? Oh, Phelps was big. It's not much smaller now. I mean, there wasn't any people there then. There's no people there now much, except country folk moving new houses. We drove up there. I worked in Houston all day. He worked a job all day. And then we'd get home from work and drive to Phelps, preach, sing, meet with maybe seven or eight people, head back home, get up the next morning, go back to Houston to work. We got a 12 dozen eggs and 20 bucks for the week. They were good eggs. Good eggs. And the pastor gave me the 20. But I'd have preached if people would have charged me, which I don't do now, and that's a shame, isn't it? Wouldn't it be good if God could work in this old preacher's heart again and get him to the point where once again he'd say, let me pay you. I want to preach. I'll pay you. I'll pay you $100. Let me preach. And what we'd want to do is advertise that because there's surely something in that. There's something going on here. Get people here. It's going to be fun. But no, it wasn't. It was just my heart then. And I still want to share what Jesus did for me because what he did for me, he's done for many others, and the people who need him most need to hear it. That's why you don't have to be someone with some big plan to be a witness. You just tell them what he's done for you. You just tell them what's happened in your life. I'm not what I used to be. I'm a sinner at one time. Now I'm saved by grace, and I still blow it sometime. But I'm telling you, my motivation is to please the Lord because he changed my heart motive. He changed my soul. This is uh, pretty amazing happenings in Jerusalem, isn't it? It's going to stir people up, especially the authorities, and that's what it's done. And, the high, and I love this uh, slapstick comedy that's going on when they can't find him in the jail. The guards are standing by the doors, making sure nobody gets them out. Everything's in place. The locks are in position. And they send these uh, men to bring them to the Senate meeting. And they get it all open. The guards are there. They open it up and go in, and nobody's home. Now, what do you do with that? Well, the first thing you're going to recognize is nobody duped the guards. They're still standing here, and all the locks are in. They're, it's still shut up, but they're not here, which means something has happened pretty supernatural, I would think. See, the first time these men spent the night in jail, they didn't get out. They just stayed till the next day. Remember? Just a little before this time in Acts. This time, God simply reveals himself to them, letting them know, I got a job for you to do, and if you'll just keep doing the job, I'll take care of you until I've finished with you what I want from you. So they were out. Freedom came in the middle of this lockup, and they were instructed to go preach again where they'd been preaching, and they at daybreak, at daybreak. Undoubtedly, people were flowing there at daybreak. Things are already happening. The caller has already announced the things that are taking place, and the people are moving into position, and Peter is preaching again. This same gospel, lifting up this same Jesus all the way along. Wow. And people are still being added to the church. Now, here's what I like about this. God, when you deal with the living God and you really know you've come up to where he is, you're either repelled by him in his majesty or you are attracted to him in his glorious humility and love. And it all happens at the same time. How many of you know there was a time when you were called by him, you were attracted to him, you heard the gospel message, you heard the for repentance, you heard about your sin, need to that sin and turn to Christ, but you didn't want to run from him. You heard about judgment, but you didn't want to run from him. He was drawing you to him, and you were attracted to this God being revealed. While someone else hearing the same message repelled by it. 
God at work. And attitude and how we respond to God at work varies from time to time. Here we have someone wanting him, and we have someone else rebelling against him. And God knows how to get rebels in the house. He does. He knows how to save sinners, the worst of sinners. He knows how to work in our lives, what he wants to work in them. Anyway, they ended up back before the Senate, went and got them, found out they were down there preaching. And the high priest questioned them, said, We charged you not to teach in this name. Here you fill Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Not going to say Jesus. This name, this man. We know who he's talking about. Peter knows who he's talking about. And he said, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, and they were angry. And Gamaliel steps in. Gamaliel was not a Christian. There is some argument that he was, but I think not. He slows it down, but he doesn't necessarily let them off. He lets them get beat. Doesn't argue about that. They can get whipped, no problem. Just don't kill them. Gamaliel was pleading for them not to kill them although they wanted to. The radical Eastern mindset hop happened a long time ago already. I mean, that's just the nature sometimes of people in that simplicity there as it was then. They, they're angry. I mean, we have the authority to get rid of this guy, although they could not pronounce a death sentence and carry it out themselves. They had to get some help from the Romans for that, which is what they did with Jesus. Had certain rules, certain things they couldn't do. And so he speaks to them, and they call them back, said, good idea, and they whip them, and again remind them not to preach anymore in Jesus' name and send them out of there. So what do we do now? Well, they go back to teaching, right back to it, one more time. I'm not going to read these statements, but, but in chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 2, chapter 4, and chapter 5, there are summary statements about the church. Um, once these events start happening, then it tells they were together and they had these in common and they're doing and they and they were listening to the apostles' teaching and they were breaking bread from house to house and they were praying and it gives us a little insight into what was happening with the new church here. Three times, chapter two, chapter four, and here in chapter five, which I just looked at with you, verses twelve through sixteen. We probably could hold that mirror of uh, church in Jerusalem up in front of any congregation today and let us take a look for a while. And it should be challenging to us. What are we doing that requires the Holy Spirit to get it done? I guess maybe the better way to say it is are we doing anything that's going to require supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to get it done? What is the one thing always that we have that does that. It's when you proclaim this gospel or tell the story of what he's done for. When you share Jesus or preach the gospel, you can't save anybody. You can't, I can't change a heart. It's going to require a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to bring regeneration to a lost person. What is my job? Believe that and proclaim it. Tell it. And then leave God at work with it. Witness to the resurrection. Jesus is alive. He's present. He's at work by the Holy Spirit and can transform your life and give you hope beyond this life. The early church had an outreach that was supernatural in power. They had an outreach where God could still work and bring them freedom even though they were locked up in bondage. They were no longer in bondage at all inside. They were free. They were free. They needed some opposition in order to sharpen who they were in Christ Jesus and make them even more effectual by depending on Him and the suffering 
although we don't like to admit suffering is part of the Christian life, and part of the journey of a human being, it is if we follow Jesus. We reign with him finally, Pastor, if we suffer with him. To add another part to that statement in Scripture. He gets us to that usable place in the process of how he takes us on this journey. What impact are we making? We don't know. Except that if we're sharing the gospel, the impact is being made. The Holy Spirit is using your testimony, your words, mine, to make a difference in life. That's what he's doing. Now, let me just take a moment, and then I'll be done. I, I want to look at this phrase in verse 31. Chapter 5, verse 31, I read through it, pointed it out a little bit ago. <coughs> Where the scripture says this, God exalted him. This is after you killed him by hanging him on a tree, Peter says. God exalted him at his right hand as leader, as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see that? Now, let me deal with the word leader just a little bit. What, anybody got a different word in there besides leader? ESV is leader. What is it, Les? Prince. Prince. That's King James. Prince, and prince is in several others. What is the New American Standard? Bob, you still using it? Oh, it came into the world of the ESV. That's good. Prince, in the, yeah, it should be in the uh, New American Standard. All right, um, the word is um, archegon, archegon, A-R-C-H-E, long E, A sound, G-O-N, it's G-O-S, but in this usage, it's G-O-N, same word, root. It's only used four times in the New Testament, four times, that's it, every time for Jesus, every time for Jesus. Now, the reason I said that is because I'm going to read those four verses or so. Third chapter, Acts, back up, just uh, two chapters, one page probably, back to um, the third chapter, and I'll read around verse 15, so you get the, kind of the setting for it. Um, verse 14, let me back up a little before that even. 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Abraham, the God of uh, God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the archegon of life. Author. See that? Same word. Be translated author, leader, prince, and more. That's the other time. That's the second time in Acts, and that's the only two times we get that in Acts. You, here he is right here in verse number 15. Let me point it out one more time. And you killed the author of life. Now, when you say author of life, you would be saying maybe originator, wouldn't you? Founder, well, those two words are also translatable with this word. True, yes. Beginner. Um, but leader as well. So here is one, and I, I think we know in our, in our hearts we know this, understand it from Scripture, that Jesus is indeed the leader of God's people. Everybody know that? The leader. He's the one who came, the prince of his people. We sometimes refer to him as the prince of peace. The leader of the people. Let's go back to Joshua 
for a moment. I won't take any time with this because I don't have time, but Joshua and Jesus are the same name. You knew that, right? Joshua, coming Hebrew there, and Jesus over in Greek. Uh, we got these two names. Joshua is not exactly like Jesus, certainly. Uh, he doesn't have that supernatural stuff working. him. He's not, he's not Jesus, who Jesus was. But you remember when he saw the guy, met the guy with the sword? Outside of, um, what town was he going to take? Yeah, outside of Jericho. And he meets this guy carrying a sword. He sees him standing there. Let me just get the exact wording from Joshua. It'll take me a second here. There we are. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. This is a, a warrior, a military man, a leader in warfare of some kind. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now listen to his answer. No. That's what he said. Are you for us or for our adversaries? No. <laughs> now, we got some kind of unique situation here, don't we? He said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. In other words, no, I'm not on your side. You're on mine. This is the point. You're on my side. And I read on here for just a moment, and he said, No, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. No, but I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Now I'm here. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so in the presence of the Lord, who is a commander, a prince, who leads the host of the Lord. Now we get a glimpse of Jesus when he comes. He's the leader. He's the ruler. And you know what makes it possible? The fact that he came as a man and lived through the whole process and overcame sin and died for sin and went to hell and came out of that grave, resurrected, reveals to us not only did he walk the way God wanted him to walk, he walked the way before us and now is capable of giving to us what we could never have for ourselves, the very life of the Spirit of God to us. Because he not only went through that way as a man, he comes out on the other side with the capabilities of passing it to us, giving us the life, giving us the life. He's the ruler. He's the prince. He's the leader. He's the beginner. He's the author. He's the originator. Or Kagon. Let me read these other two and give a little more insight and we're done. See, I'm not able to give you much except something to chew on, but that's good. Because you're reading your Bible every week, right? And you're chewing on Scripture every week. I see heads nodding. You've got to do that. I mean, this is, this is important stuff. This is God's Word to His church. Just don't get choked on too much. Just start slow if you haven't started. What am I looking for? I'm finding out as I get older, if I'm talking, my thinker kind of runs off somewhere. I'm trying to remember something. Anybody have that problem yet? I start talking, I can't remember what I'm doing. If I start doing, I can't remember what I'm saying. It's bad. It's really bad. So you're going to have to help me preach the next year or so here. Get it done, right? Just so just wave, raise your hand and say, I can help you. I'll let you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Um, we're looking for, for this uh, founder of, of salvation here. Now back up to verse 8. We see him, that is, we don't see everything in subjection to him yet, the writer of the Hebrews said, thinking about this Messiah. But we see him, verse 9, 8, 9, 
But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for who? Everyone. Now, verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory. Anybody part of that? Bringing sons to glory? Oh, yes. In bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation or the prince of their salvation or the originator of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Because founder is the word archegon. Same word. And we're talking about Jesus who brings many sons to glory, including us, and he's able to do it because he went to glory and prepared the way. You still here? Just a, a brief note about that. When he died, he went into the darkness where no man had ever been because no one had ever died and descended to where he went and stayed there, literally dead. He's not done. He bore sin on our behalf and went to the place of the sinner, into the grave, into the place of the dead, that place where, which couldn't hold him. Because it wasn't his sin. He was sinless. But he went into the place of darkness and came back to the sunshine and walked on the earth yet and lived. And it's that whole process of dying, being buried, being raised, and ascending that makes possible my salvation. He's the founder by his journey of salvation for you and me the originator he as a man walked there he came willingly as a servant and submitted to death as a sacrifice for sin that he might make it possible for us who believe in him to have imparted to us his righteousness to have indwelling us his spirit, to have promised to us that reward when we get home, the inheritance in the kingdom of God. The founder of our salvation. Now you will know where this last scripture is because we've, some of us have quoted and used these scriptures here for, for so long. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. This is 12.1 in Hebrews. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder, the ESV says. The founder and the, where did it go? Perfecter of our faith. He originates faith. He lived by faith, ladies and gentlemen, as a man. His faith was in God and God's word he obeyed. He knew God would do everything he said he would do and he in turn did everything God commanded him to do. His life was one of trust in God. He went to the cross trusting in God. He went to the grave trusting in God. He rose out from the dead, raised up by God who trust, he trusted in. I should slow down every now and then and say things with space in between, shouldn't I? So we could think about it. Because it's important to think about. Looking to Jesus, the author is the old King James word, remember? The author, same, same word again. Same word. Author and finisher. New, that's the King James. Author and finisher. I like that. He made this salvation possible for you. And he is in the process of finishing it. And he will, this great salvation, finish it when he comes again to receive us unto himself. And the inheritance is bestowed. Salvation done. Home. 
we arrive. Wow. Guess who's leading the church at the very beginning in Jerusalem? Guess who is the leader? It's the one who has died and been raised and ascended and promised to come again, who's at work through those apostles, and he is accomplishing what his salvation makes possible in the lives of men and women who will listen and believe. So that everyone who hears what Peter, John, and others are preaching and believes it have imparted to them this great life gift that Jesus bought and paid for in his own blood. You're blessed, and I am too, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Leader, originator, maybe both. Just keep them together, because that's who he is. What he accomplished, he is able to deliver to you. What he has done, he's able to bring us into. He went through suffering. Yes, we follow him through suffering, but suffering only shapes us. We're disciplined even by the Father as we live if we're truly His. Why? So that we don't get taken over by the world, so that we don't lose the reality of who we are and what it means to be shaped by Him for the glory to come. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege always to come and sit at Your feet and to open our hearts to your word and like a little bird sit and open our hearts like opening our mouth and say Lord feed me teach me shape me make me that I might fly with you thank you father for working in every life here and if there's a one single person or two or three who've never really surrendered to you and surrendered their life to this life-giving reality that you bring May you touch their hearts today and start the process. May you love them until they know they're being loved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you want prayer.